I the, guess we're ready coaster. to roll, everybody. So uh, we're going to go do the uh, William Nelson hike. Are we ready? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, did I didn't talk about that. <laughs> oh, plans. I, I, gears I got my shirt for the Wallace That's hike. Right. <laughs> 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 is that the wrong one? Huh? Am I here for the wrong tour? You got the right last name. Let's see. Yeah, that one is down at Hell's Hollow, don't it? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> You know, Wallace, this Wallace was the colonel of the 11th Illinois. And yeah. Lou Wallace was Colonel of the 11th Indiana. Oh, and yeah. when they met on the field at Fort Donaldson, W.H.L. Wallace told him, Oh, we're the reason for all the cussing in the post office. Because <laughs> they write letters to <laughs> Colonel Wallace's 11th Regiment. And who, who did he go to? You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had to take uh, the basic right. training. All right, so I guess we're going to do a carpool this morning. So we're going to try and pile into as many people as we can in as few cars as we can. So we're going to be doing, we're going to be parking along roadways. Yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. So we're going to try not to. Yeah, we're going to be doing We're going to be parking along roadways, I would imagine. Yeah. So we're going to try not to block the road too badly. And and I guess that's it. Right. So, I, load up, that's head good. out. Right. That's good. Let me explain to you where we're going. Um, first of all, what I'll try to do, uh, we're going to make probably, <clears throat> well, I haven't even thought about it. We'll just Stop swing whenever. it by ear, you know, as we go. But four, five, six different stops showing you some of the old road beds, and we'll do a little hiking and, and so on. Um, but we're going to follow <laughs> the route of Lou Wallace's march to Shotland. Um a lot of people, most people say, you know, just the common everyday perception, the, the common, you know, public opinion is that Lou Wallace was lost. Well, he was not lost. Lou Wallace knew the road system out here. He knew where the Shun Pike went. We'll talk about the Shun Pike later. He knew where the, the river road was and all that. Uh, I'm convinced that it was a classic case of miscommunication. We'll get into that as, as, we, um, as we go forward. Uh, basically, what you need to know, there are two roads that Wallace could have utilized to come to the battlefield. One is the river road that runs right through the battlefield here, um, uh, all across the Snake Creek Bridge, of course, and then to Crump. And that's the one that we're going to follow a little bit as we go forward. Now, um, I wish we had some kind of walkie-talkies or something, but you couldn't even do that with, with multiple vehicles. Uh, so what I'll try to do at each stop is tell you what we're going to see as, as we go to be watching out. Uh, so we're going to go out and cross Snake Creek, of course, on Highway 22. Uh, and then up on the high ground, we're going to take a left, and then we're going to take a right. So when we take that right, we will be on the historic trace of the old river road. Now, Wallace's troops didn't march through that, but just to show you some of the, the original uh, river road till we come back out on the Highway 22. Uh, those that will be in the vehicle, I guess I'll carry my truck to, to lead the way. Um, I can get four, I guess, in there. Or if we've got something bigger, I can just ride with somebody else. It, it doesn't matter how we do it. but. <laughs> Whoever's in my vehicle, of course, I'm going to be telling you, you know, the road went here and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, that's what we'll be seeing. Then we'll make our first stop at Crump's Landing itself. Uh, and then I'll probably then tell you what we saw and then what we're going to what we're gonna see next. So that's kind of how, how we'll do it. And then we'll actually hike this afternoon when, uh, when the weather warms up just a little bit. Kind of chilly out here. Hank got a, he got a coat on, a, a light coat. <laughs> it's balmy weather for him up in the rocks. <laughs> Uh, he's put on a, a light windbreaker here. <laughs> well, Jim says it's going to get cold. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> Wisconsin's still probably white now, or is already white now. From Where I'm buying my new winter home, it was 9 degrees yesterday morning. <laughs> 9 degrees. <laughs> yeah. I decided not to go up there yet. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> I thought this was your Summer home. We were talking Summer about global warming. I said, I'm all for it. <laughs> 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 Let it warm up. I'm for it. <laughs> yeah, down here it's going to turn 114 every day, right? <laughs> All right, well, I'm ready when y'all are. Well, how do we want to do it? Just, uh, just pile in. Well, I need to get a couple things. I can hold it. We've got big How you doing? Left and then turn back right. Mm -hmm. You were on the historic river road then. Uh, and then we came back into Highway 22. And then where we turned right again after the, the little creek, you were, um, you were on the historic route there. Now, the river road, of course, better known, or really it's better known as, as really the river road, but. Um, it's the same as the Hamburg Savannah Road that starts down at Hamburg, runs through the battlefield, and then, of course, up to Crump's here, and then eventually on on uh, to 
to Savannah. You can see Savannah here at some places. Um, we probably have to go up there. You can see the Savannah Bridge, uh, but you can see the water tower. See the top of the water tower there? That is Savannah. So it's just right above the bend there. It takes a big bend to the north, and that's where Grant uh, uh, headquarters is, the Cherry Mansion. Uh, Lou Wallace makes his headquarters here at Crump's Landing. Uh, the river will, will come south and then make a big bend to the east and then make a big bend to the south. This is, this is that big bend. There are two or three islands right here in this bend uh, and this is Crump's Landing. Now we don't know exactly where uh, Mrs. Crump's house was uh, but we know this is obviously the, the general area. There is that um, that photograph in uh, Battles and Leaders, if you've looked at the, the uh, Lou Wallace thing in Battles and Leaders, and it shows up on kind of one of these bluffs right here, right over there or, or something. Uh, Lou Wallace himself came back in 1901 and, um, and traced the route that we're going to go on today. And in fact, that's what I have used to, uh, to document where the route actually is. Um, when, when they came back, they put stakes in the ground and said, this is where my headquarters tent was. And the intention was to come back and put some of those pyramidal cannonball monuments like it, uh, like it shallow, but the park commission just never, never got around to it. So uh, I wish that stake was still here, you know, obviously 150, 100 years later and all that is, is impossible, but I uh, um, wish we knew exactly where his headquarters uh, actually was. Um, the, the way we found the route, going to that just a little bit before we get into the actual history, uh, there is a map that was produced uh, out of this visit that Wallace came back in 1901. I believe it was 1901. Uh, Wallace had come back several times. He had been in here in like 1895. Uh, I think he'd come uh, another time. But then he came back with the Park Commission in the early 1900s to finally document exactly where everything was. And he has a couple of intentions for doing this. Number one is to clear his name. Wallace uh, is always basically under what Gail Stevens calls the shadow of Shiloh. Anybody read Gail Stevens' biography of, uh, of Lou Wallace? Wonderful. I love good titles that just encapsulate and, and, mm -hmm. and capture the, uh, the essence of what you're talking about. And that one does perfectly. Uh, Lou Wallace is under the shadow of Shiloh for the rest of his life. <laughs> he never gets out from under this. Um, he, even though he is minister to Constantinople, Governor of New Mexico Territory writes a best-selling novel and bunches of novels and and all of that. He still is under this shadow of Shallow, and he keeps uh, seemingly wanting Grant's approval. You know, to, to help me, Grant. Tell him, tell him that I wasn't lost. Tell him that uh, you know. And he doesn't get a whole lot out of out of Grant except one little message. You know, right right in Grant's memoirs, it says, "Well, I'm I really am not." confident to say what the order said and, and all that. We'll talk about that later. There's a great letter in, um, I believe it's in uh, the University of Virginia archives, special collections, that I think uh, encapsulates this as well as when Wallace wrote his first novel. Ben Hur was not his first novel. I think his first novel was, uh, what was it, Ang The Angry Gods or, or something. It's about Cortez in, in Mexico. And uh, he wrote this, I believe, in the, in the 1870s. And so when it came out, he sent Grant a copy of this book and uh, of course Grant's president at this time and Grant you know piddling little folks why we, we fool Wallace anymore uh, but the, the letter says basically is to to Grant and it says I'm, I'm sending you this copy I would like for you to read it and and tell me what you think of the the battle characterizations and the descriptions of battle and, and all that it's almost if you know Wallace is still pleading Grant like me, you know, <laughs> help me here. Do you know? Say something positive about me. He is still under the shadow uh, of of Shallow here. So he's he comes back here and he wants to clear his name. Of course, by this point, early 1900s, Grant's dead, so he can uh, you know uh, have kind of the last last word a little bit. And so uh, he comes back here to try to. You know, tell the park commission this is where I was and this is what I was doing. Uh, he also wants to find the original route, and he wants to to also uh, kind of feed into this idea that Wallace. In, if you've read his autobiography, anybody read his autobiography? If you read his autobiography, he says I turned around at Owl Creek. I was just right across the creek 
from the battlefield and from the Confederates and, and I should have just continued on into the battlefield and I would have taken the Confederate army in the rear and would have won the battle and, and all that. And so he wants to come and show everybody that yes, this is where I turned around and so on. Now in actuality, as we'll see, he's nowhere near Owl Creek. He's actually at Clear Creek, but he thinks he is at Owl Creek, but he wants to show everybody, yes, this is where I turn around. And what happens is he gets out there and he says, well, yeah, I was wrong. Yeah, I wasn't at Owl Creek because they, they, they went to where he turned around and he says, yes, this is where I turned around. This is Owl Creek. And, and the historian D.W. Reed said, uh, no, this is not Owl Creek. This is Clear Creek. And then they carried him on the continuation of the route that he would have, he would have gone on and showed him this is our creek and he finally had to admit well yeah I was I was I was wrong at any rate out of that visit um, there there's this map produced at Will Thompson the park engineer uh, creates this map and it is very similar to the ones that you see the read maps that you can buy in the visitor or the bookstore and you see in the visitor center and all that but it's a larger it's got that in it but it's a larger version of this area that Wallace uh, marched on I uh, found it to be extremely accurate. Uh, in fact, the park, to my knowledge and to anybody else's knowledge, doesn't have a copy of this map. Uh, I had to work off of um, copies that were made of it that appeared in like the Iowa Journal of History and Politics and so on back in the in the 19 teens and so on. Um, the only known hard copy of this map is actually in the Indiana Historical Society. They sent me a copy and, and all of that. Um, probably what happened when the tornado came through here in 1909 and destroyed the visitor center at Pittsburgh Landing and, and the hotel and the archives and all that, it probably blew all those original maps away. It's the park doesn't even have a, uh, a hard copy, an original copy of that that nobody you know, knows about. It may be stuck back in a wall somewhere, you know, behind some plaster or something. Who, who knows what all's around, but, um, but in the map files and so on, there is not a, a original one of these. Um, but you use the ones out of the Journal of uh, whatever politics and so on. Um, overlay that on this this original map. Overlay that on modern maps and get it all just perfect and so on. And you can see the the original routes and the the way we know that it's it's so accurate. Atwell Thompson, if you know anything about the engineer Atwell Thompson, he was extremely tedious and, and accurate and so on. And where uh, it shows that the the maps roads are today. Uh, where they should be. A lot of places is original roads that are, are modern day roads that you can you can still follow, the, the curves and all that. Um, where there are not modern roads and it says this is where the road should be out on some private property, you go out there and talk to the property owners and say can I go out and look in your woods and so on and you go out there and lo and behold where it says it should be there is a deep road cut. You know, So the map is extremely accurate and uh, for that reason, we could determine exactly where the, the route was. So I got the big idea in 2005. Well, let's hike this thing. And let's, <laughs> let's start one morning and uh, time ourselves. And uh, the superintendent went with us and he took his GPS. Turns out it's about 17 miles, which is more than, than uh, what Wallace or anybody said it, it was. Uh, it was like 16.8 or, so, or something like that. Uh, and we timed ourselves and took the same amount of time for lunch that Wallace did and all that. Anyway, Wallace did it about 15 minutes quicker than we did, a group of about eight people in 2005. And we didn't have artillery or wagons or, you know, muskets and muddy roads and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, in fact, Gail Stevens went with us. I called Gail and I told her what we were going to do and, you know, said, you're more than welcome. She was working on her biography then. Said, more than welcome to come join us. And boy, she hopped right on that. Uh, Bjorn, many of you know Bjorn, and uh, he had been a seasonal down here <laughs> for several years. Of course, he lives in Chicago, and so uh, we we're big buddies and so on. So I called him up and I said, Hey, this is what we're doing if you're interested. And he came down from Chicago to go on because it's kind of one of the you know, once in a lifetime almost uh, things. So, uh, so we went on it, and, and it's amazing to, you know, to see the, the actual road beds and, and all that. And we're going to see a lot of that out there uh, today. I'll show you uh, most, of the, most of the best parts. So let's get into the narrative of, of the history of what happens, of course. Uh, Wallace is camped here at Crump's Landing uh, beginning mid-March of 1862. When the Federals first reached this area, there are two main thrusts that... Um, 
that they will involve themselves in. One is headed westward from Crump's Landing, one is headed southward down the Tennessee River. Now the goal of each one of these is to break the Confederate railroads. Mobile and Ohio lies about uh, I'd say 20 or so miles, 25 miles to our west through the modern day town of Selma, which uh, was not there then, but it ran through Bethel Springs and, and, uh, and that area. Uh, so Wallace lands his division here in mid-March, moves out, very rainy weather and so on. He does, uh, some of the cavalry does destroy some of the bridges and so on, and then he pulls back to Crump's Landing. Sherman, meanwhile, has gone down into Mississippi to try to break the Memphis and Charleston Railroad. Uh, he is not able to do that because the heavy uh, rains and so on come through in mid-March. The river rises 20 or 15 feet in 24 hours, and so the river is, is very, very high. Um, the only landing that Sherman can utilize coming back down river from Mississippi. Uh, the first one he sees is Pittsburgh Landing and that's why he lands there, uh, gets his men off the boat, gets uh, Hurlbut's men off the boat, and uh, that will become the Army encampment and as we know the rest of course is, is uh, history. Meanwhile Lew Wallace remains here and uh, he will continue to remain here. His headquarters here with one brigade and that is uh, Smith's Brigade, ML Smith's Brigade, Morgan Smith's Brigade. Um, he will have three brigades in his division. One he will send out to Adamsville, that's Charles Whittlesey's brigade, which is about five miles to our west, closer to the, the, um, uh, the railroad. And then he'll station a, a brigade in an intermediate area, uh, halfway between here in Adamsville, and that's a place called Stony Lonesome, a little high place in the, in the road. Uh, there's a good vet there. If anybody needs a, uh, a vet around, you can, you can utilize that, but you're right. Just, right on the northern or the uh, western slopes of, of Stony Lopes from there. And I think some of the soldiers are buried right in there too. Oh really? Great. You think so? There's stuff happens on top of Yeah, really? You haunted? The haunted vet? <laughs> no, it's, 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 it's really odd. It's just yeah. that well, we may, this yeah, this may get interesting. We're going to hear more about it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> at any rate, the reason uh, Wallace puts a brigade at Stony Lonesome, of course, is that that is the opening of the other route by which he could reach the battlefield, and that is what is called the Shun Pike. Uh, and the Shun Pike was apparently an old stage road, a, a, a fairly well used road at the time. So, Wallace has two options if uh, either he is attacked here in his isolated position, or the rest of the army is attacked at Pittsburgh Landing. It can work either way. It's kind of a, a plan that, you know, if they're attacked, we can march to support them. If we're attacked, they can march to support us. Well, the river road, unfortunately, is underwater, particularly at the Snake Creek Bridge, which is known as the Wallace Bridge, not because of Wallace, because of a former landowner there, which is kind of ironic when you, when you think about it. So it really wasn't named Wallace because of, of Lou Wallace. But he could cross there, but it's underwater up until actually April the 4th, maybe 5th um, of, uh, of April. Uh, the bridge by the 6th is actually not underwater anymore, but the approaches to it are, and you have to walk through, you know, a, a knee deep or so, and a lot of the, the troops that finally go across there talk about wading through water to get to the bridge and, and all that. So with that route shut down, immediately you think, okay, if we got to go to the battlefield, we use the other route, the Shun Pike. So that's why he is interested in Stony Lonesome and, and the Shun Pike. Now, the river road, as we see, runs basically toward Pittsburgh Landing, very near Pittsburgh Landing. The Shun Pike will come out on the Hamburg Purdy Road, which is the only major lateral road on the battlefield, um, right there at the Sod Farm, the barbecue place. Uh, what is the corner barbecue that, that uh, uh, you may know about? Good, good place to eat. So uh, it comes out there and then you take the Hamburg Purdy Road right across Isle Creek. That's where Wallace thought he was when he turned around, but he wasn't. And then you're right on the, the, uh, the battlefield there. So when Grant hears the firing on the morning of April the 6th and realizes, okay, something is up to my southwest, I better get on the boat and get going. So he hops on the Tigers, of course, and he starts steaming um, upriver against the current. Takes a little while to do it, of course. And so he rounds this bend here, and then he rounds this next bend, and he comes in to where Wallace has his headquarters boat, the John J. Rowe. And uh, there are different accounts, but basically they stop the boat and lash the boats together. And Wallace is on his boat. Grant's on the Tigers, and they stand and they talk to each other, you know, over, over the rails there. 
And basically, Grant tells Wallace, okay, hold your command in readiness, and I'll send you orders. Now, Grant had originally thought maybe Wallace was under attack. But by the time he gets here, Wallace says, oh, nothing's going on here. You know, I can hear it down there. It must be at Pittsburgh Landing. So Grant realizes, okay, it's at Pittsburgh Landing. I better get on, get on down there. Why he didn't tell Wallace to come on, march on, don't know. Unless he was thinking maybe it's a diversion, you know, maybe the real attack is coming here. Why not try to pick off an isolated division rather than the whole army, you know, a, a fog of war. A lot of things are going on in Grant's mind. But he tells him, hold your command in readiness. So, Wallace makes critical decision here. He says, okay, I'm going to have to go to the battlefield. Nothing's going on around here. He's getting word from his scouts out as far as Adamsville that nothing's, nothing's going on. In fact, Frank Cheatham's division, who Wallace is here to watch partially, uh, has moved to join the Confederate Army. So there's, there's nothing much out there but just, you know, incidental cavalry. Wallace doesn't necessarily know that, uh, but he knows nothing is going on here. So he's thinking, I've got to go to the battlefield, so what's the best way to get to the battlefield? Snake Creek. River Road may be still underwater. We're not sure. Portions of it are. So, hey, we better take the shun pike, right? So he concentrates, he orders a concentration of his division at Stony Lonesome. Smith's brigade will march out to Stony Lonesome. Uh, Whittlesey's brigade gets orders to march eastward to Stony Lonesome, although it's delayed and, and they don't do that. And, um, and as a result, Wallace is thinking, okay, we're going to march from Stony Lonesome down the shun pike to the Hamburg Purdy Road and over uh, to the camps, Sherman's camps. Okay, so Wallace begins to wait. All right, I'm getting, I'm getting word here. Uh, you know, Grant said he'd send me word. In, in Wallace's autobiography, he talks about, you know, 10:15 uh, passed, 10:30 passed, 10:45 passed, and nothing. And we can hear the battle growing louder and louder down there. And Wallace is getting upset and, and uptight. Uh, eventually, a staff officer does come, a quartermaster named Baxter. Grant has gotten to Pittsburgh Landing. He's realized the main attack is here, and I've got to send somebody back to, to get Wallace here. So he will send Rawlins to tell Baxter to uh, to come this direction. I'm sorry, let me cut this off. Um, I have no idea who that is. Uh, <laughs> doesn't matter. Yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, hey, that's Grant's calling. Yeah, Grant. Hey, Grant, hey, get on the road. Start, start moving there. Uh, Rawlins will tell Baxter, go tell Wallace to come support the, the army. Uh, Baxter says, okay, I'm just a little staff officer. I want this in writing. So Rawlins goes on the Tigers and writes out the orders. Baxter comes back down river, gets to, to Crump's Landing here, and Wallace is with his division concentrating Stone and Lonesome, but he has left a horse here. So Baxter gets on the horse, right. <laughs> Right, let me, let me just, uh, I don't know who it is, but I'm going to turn it down so it won't ring again. Um, so Baxter gets out to Wallace at, uh, at Stony Lonesome, and that's where he tells the fateful orders for Wallace uh, to move. Now, what do these orders say? This is the crux of the problem here. What does the order actually say? Well, Wallace says... The order says, move your division and come to the right of the army. And Wallace immediately thinks what? Where's the right of the army? Use the Shunpike, Sherman, Shallow Church. Shunpike comes out right there. Grant says, the order said, move your division to Pittsburgh Landing. If it had said that, what road would he have used? The river road. Okay, what did the order actually say? Here's a quiz, any of you. What did the order actually say? It's a trick question. Nobody knows because Wallace hands the order to one of his staff officers, Neffler, who says he put it in his belt. I mean, you ever put anything in your belt? Do you, do you ever put anything in your belt? You don't do just you, right? Yeah, you don't do that. And and uh, you know he loses the order. Now some have wondered whether he purposefully, you know, <laughs> later on when they figure out we goofed up. Um, anyway, nobody knows what the order said. And so, as a result, we 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 can't you know pass judgment anywhere. Uh, Grant does later on admit Wallace just goes to his grave saying you know this was this it said go to the right of the army so that's why I used the shun pike. Uh, Grant later does admit that I really can't say for sure what the order said because I didn't see the order because I told Rollins Rollins told Baxter Baxter told Wallace 
and it's the, I always use the example, let's just play the game. I'm going to whisper something in your ear. You tell him, you tell him, and on down the line. And by the time he gets to Michelle down here, it's probably going to be, you ever played that game with kids yeah. and so on? It's probably going to be different, right? I think some yeah. people are just cantankerous and, and change it just to be mean. <laughs> uh, but who knows what the order actually said. And uh, in that sense, Grant does kind of give Wallace just a little bit of, of, of a break there. Uh, but the, the die is cast, the Rubicon is crossed, and Wallace will march because of what he thinks the orders say. Uh, he will begin the march down uh, the Shun Pike. And just to, to lay out the whole thing of what happens, I bet they're cold. <laughs> Here comes Grant, so uh, get ready for your orders. <laughs> Tigers was Down. a little little bigger than that. Downsized. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, anybody know what happens to the Tigers? At Vicksburg. At Vicksburg. In the second run around Vicksburg, uh, it, is, it is actually something. Um, the Flagstaff is in Cairo. The what? Illinois. The Flagstaff is? Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't either. But the, the, the Custom House, it's now a museum. Really? Oh, no. So it says they, they salvage the, the Flagstaff. Flagstaff. Oh, no. Uh, just to, to finish the story and tell you what we're going to see, we're going to go out to Stony Lonesome. Uh, Wallace will march southward on the Shun Pike, crossing several creeks, Snake Creek. Uh, he'll pass Overshot Mill, Snake Creek, uh, and then Graham Creek, and then he'll get to Clear Creek. It is there that Grant, who is beginning to get impatient, where's Wallace? He should have been here, you know, hours ago. Um, he starts sending staff officers, various, uh, there's a cavalryman that's sent, some say there's another cavalryman sent, uh, and then he sends staff officers. Finally, uh, one of his staff officers, Rowley, gets to Wallace while they're stopped at Clear Creek and they're reconnoitering across the creek to make sure it's safe to cross and, and all that. And uh, that's where uh, Rowley tells Wallace that, no, you can't go this way because if you do, you know, the lines have been pushed back. In fact, he really gets his attention. He says, don't you know the Army's been pushed back and there's a chance we may not make it out of this at all? You know, we may, we may lose the whole thing. Wallace says, you know, I admit I was, I was shaken by this news. So, obviously you can't keep going because you're going to be in, in behind the Confederate Army then if you pop out on the, on the Hamburg Purdy Road. Wallace later says, I should have done this, but that's a bunch of, that's, that's pure hogwash there is, is what it is. Um, so Wallace has to turn around and counter march back to find a road that he can move over to get on the river road. It's called the crossover road. And I'll show you where all of that is uh, as, um, as well. So he, he moves back to the crossover road, then over to the river road, and then into the battlefield. And that's what we're going to see uh, for the rest of the time. Now, deal with the counter march a little bit. Uh, Wallace has three brigades, Smiths, Thayers, and Whittlesey's. His favorite brigade is Smith's and um, the reason it's his favorite brigade of course is that it was his old brigade. It has his own 11th Indiana Regiment in it, also the 8th Missouri Regiment. He had fought these at Fort Henry and um, uh, uh, later Fort Donaldson of course we saw him last year at, at Fort Donaldson and so it's his favorite brigade. Uh, people have faulted Wallace because he counter marches instead of just about facing. Had he about faced Whittlesey's brigade would have been in the lead and as a result would have gotten to the battlefield first and potentially gotten all the glory. Who does he want to get to the battlefield first? Whose troops does he trust the most? Who does he like the most? Who does he want to get the glory? His own old brigade, his 11th Indiana and 8th Missouri. So he actually counter marches and, and swings the, the head of the column back through. That takes more time, of course, and, and people jump on him for that. So there are, you know, some questionable decisions here. Um, but the, the theory that Wallace was lost and that he just bungled through this, I think is, is quite unfair. In fact, the old movie, if y'all watched the old movie, Shallow Portrait of a Battle, y'all have all seen that probably. One of my favorite scenes in there is when they're talking about Wallace, and Wallace is off his horse with his staff and so on, and they're, they're talking to this civilian, you know. And that actually happened, a guy named Dick Pickens. They found out here uh, to, <clears throat> to show him some route to get from the Shun Pike over to the River Road. Uh, but in the film, they're standing there, and they got this map out, and the old civilian just takes his hat off, and he kind of scratches his head like, well, I don't know any of the roads around here. I don't, I don't know where you should go. And, and it just, it just, it just oozes lost, you know, which um, he was not. It was, it was strictly, I think, absolute miscommunication. But 
it places Wallace under a shadow that he can't get out of for the rest of his life. And literally, he's still under today because if you just walk around Walmart in Savannah and you find anybody who's actually ever heard of Shiloh that knows anything about it, uh, what happened to Lou Wallace? Oh, he got lost at Shiloh. Yeah. Uh, that's just the, the common perception today. Uh, but it was it was nothing nothing of the sort. Do you have any questions here at Crump's Land? I want to ask you one thing. Okay. In Gail Stevens' book, she writes that Wallace had himself gone from his camp here down through Stony Lonesome, Shun Hike, to Pittsburgh Landing before this march. Right. He did. Yes. He knows the routes. He's been back and forth. In fact, he has his cavalry, and in fact, he's been in touch with Doug. Where's our WHL Wallace? There we are. Uh, he and WHL Wallace at Pittsburgh Landing have worked out uh, the roads and the routes by which they will support each other. Um, and the reason you have to do this, of course, in the days before the battle is moving around the shun pipe because the river road is underwater. So he just uh, gets point. Clear so, Creek and Owl Creek kind of confused. He gets very he confused, okay. yeah. Yeah, Later on. Um, but he, he does. knew where he was going originally. Yes, he does. Now, I would have to look back. Does she say he went all the way to Pittsburgh Landing to Pittsburgh via the Shun Bike yeah. or via the River Road? Um, I, I would have to check on that. Uh, certainly, his cavalry does. Mm -hmm. I I can't say with 100% determination whether Wallace himself I don't does. Know. I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not going to claim which. Yeah, which I, route I'm not sure what she what she says. Pittsburgh Landing at least a time or two. Uh, yeah, I, I would think so, but which route he uses, I'm not sure, but uh, in those days, you know, the general doesn't have to go on all the routes as long as your cavalry and, and so on know, you know, where to go and where to lead and, and so on, that uh, he would think is sufficient. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure totally about that. You know, there at City Hall in town, you know, it's got that marker. In Savannah? Yeah. yeah. No, no, Adams. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, by the bank? Yeah. Is that where some of them were camped? No, uh, in Adamsville, they were actually camped out by the First Baptist Church, by the cemetery. Is that, um, is that where he put some artillery on that ridge right there? Uh, the I'm not aware of artillery being out there with Whittlesey's brigade. Um, I would have to, to check on that. I uh, but I, I did, yes, Charles Whittlesey's brigade. So I did. Camp Wallace where the church is? what they kind of call camp. She talks about Camp Walls. Yeah, uh, it's about right about where on that high ground out. It's really out by where the Presbyterian Church is. If you know out okay. on the Old Stage Road. Um, That's Dollar Hill right there. Yeah, out. yeah. And I thought that might be you know where that old house sits and then it drops off. Right. And maybe he put his couple pieces of artillery right there. He could have. Of course, they're watching the the, the low ground there and, and there on the high the main ground. Road to Purdy, right? There. The Old Stage Road to Purdy, exactly. Uh, I found several letters and diaries and so on talking about we camped in Adamsville just across the road mm -hmm. from the city cemetery and so on. If you, you know, the city cemetery is where it is now, and old, okay. old stones and so on. Uh, so it was right out on that, out on that high ground that they're okay. watching, watching the crossing there. You said, yes, sir. Uh, the Hamburg Purdy Road that goes by the barbecue place is that 142? Is that the old Hamburg Purdy Road? Uh, it is uh, generally across Owl Creek there. Uh, up to where the barbecue place is and so on over to Stantonville and then you you take a, a road to the right it's um, uh, 117? Uh, off of 117 that yeah. kind of goes up goes up in the middle of nowhere and then crosses modern 64 up, yeah, up going to Hurt, Hurt, Hurt there. Uh, no you're a little too far <laughs> north I think right. it, it's a little farther west than Gilchrist I, I believe but some of that old road there, those stand behind one, behind, there were, that's some of the old road back yeah, there. Yeah, some, somewhere out in there. I've been on it, but I, I couldn't tell you today. Somebody else had a question? Yes, sir. A couple, couple of questions. Um, what time do you think Baxter was here on his emissary run? Uh, the, the timing is what is problematic here. Uh, and it all depends on what time Grant left Pittsburgh Land, and there is much, much debate over that. Some say as early as 8, some say as late as 9. Uh, if it was 9 o'clock, by the time you get on to Pittsburgh Landing, figure out what's going on there, and then think, oh yeah, I forgot about Wallace, let's send somebody back, and so on. Uh, basically, Baxter doesn't get uh, here until 11-ish. 11, maybe a little after 11 or so, he, he uh, most accounts agree that he reaches Wallace at Stony Lonesome about 11.30 and tells Wallace, get going. And then there, another timing issue, Wallace says, okay, well, i got to feed my guys. 
so he takes 30 minutes to feed them and starts about noon or so uh, to, to, to march. And uh, some people say, well, you know, you just wasted 30 minutes, but you got to feed your guys. Well, now, Baxter, didn't Baxter also, he asked Baxter how the battle was going, Baxter told him that we were driving them. Yeah, we're like winning this. the thing, you know. We're, Where it's, did he uh, get that? <laughs> who yeah. knows, yeah. yeah. Um, so Wallace had no idea. He not at this point that, well, that right? things are, yeah. are tight. Uh, but now I remember by, uh, you know, and again, this is a misperception of Shallow, uh, Beauregard talks about the Confederate advance as an alpine avalanche. You ever seen an alpine avalanche, I think? Uh, uh, I, you know, quick, yeah. Yeah, this Confederate attack is not an alpine avalanche. It is not moving that fast. In fact, the first camps are not taken until 10, well, Prentice's, you know, 9 o'clock, 8.39 or so. Uh, but the whole first line, Sherman Shallow Church and all that, doesn't pull out to 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So by this time, the first line is actually mostly still holding. Sherman's still holding at Shallow Church by the time Baxter leaves to come here. So um, it's it's not looking that dire at this point. You said hogwash. Hogwash, yeah. Uh, you said uh, Lewis, I mean, uh, Wallace. That's a Hebrew term. Or... <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, when you said, he said I should have kept going on the road, you said, but that's hogwash. Other than the fact he wasn't at the right creek, why do you say that? Well, because by that time, the Confederate Army has pushed the Union Army back, and he would have had no support whatsoever. Had he popped out behind Confederate lines, he said we would have been able to take them in, in, in rear, you know, and, and won the battle. Uh, probably what would have happened, he would have just been surrounded and captured. You know, he would have surrendered, I would I would guess. I don't know. That's one of those things we don't know. It's just surmising. But um, you, you don't want to be caught isolated, outnumbered behind enemy lines is basically what would have happened. Yeah. So. Yes, sir. Okay. I've always wondered this. This is an integral place in the whole story. Why is there not any interpretive tablet or anything here. I mean, it, it seems it, bizarre to me. Yeah, it is. You you would think so. Um, I'm trying to get one of those Tennessee Civil War trail signs. Right up that would be good. I get that. I want to ask you, did, you know, there were a lot of commissary, a lot of supplies here. Did Wallace leave any troops here to continue guard on it? Yes, he does. When uh, he gets orders to march, he will leave two or three regiments. <laughs> I forget. I think it's like the 78th Ohio and maybe the 68th Ohio. I, I would have to look specifically which regiments. Um, and a couple of pieces of artillery, I believe, uh, here at Crump's Landing to guard, you know, the camps and, and the supplies. And, and they so stay on. here? Yes, they out. stay here. They throughout. never go down to. Uh, I believe a day or so after the battle, they will go down, and then actually Wallace's division will come back up here uh, to their original, original camp. camps. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, Baxter, turns out he didn't do Wallace, I don't think, any favors when he, you know, he gets his horse here and he drives all the way to Stony Lonesome and gives Wallace the message there. And then he says he spent one minute or two minutes and then he leaves. And you would have thought if he'd have known what the message said, like the river road, maybe just maybe he would have stuck around to make sure Wallace would have come you know, sure come back go. to the river road right. because you'll take us to that point right. where he was and was on the shunt pike. Yeah. Anyway, he doesn't... He, he doesn't, doesn't help him out by any yeah. means. And I mean, maybe we couldn't fault Baxter for that because his duty is to be with the army to make sure your quartermaster supplies are, are taken care of, you know. Right. So he's probably thinking, all right, I got to get back and do my job or my tail's going to be, you know, in trouble. Because all um, his order was was to deliver the message. To, to deliver the message. Else. And, you know, I don't know, chances are Baxter has never been on these roads because right. probably following Grant around, all Grant has done is going up and down the river. So he probably doesn't know the difference in the river road and the shun pike and, and all that. But you're right, he doesn't um, he doesn't feel it necessary to hang around and aid Wallace in it. Um, but you know, on that, I've, I've read that scapegoat book uh, pretty good. He makes the point of of all people to send down here, why do you send your quartermaster? I well, mean, any, any knucklehead can bring a message down here. Why do you right. send the guy that's supposed yeah. to be logistically handling stuff? He, he could have been just the first one yeah, they find, you know, looking around, where's the staff officer? Okay, you, come here, take this, take this message. You can't be in the right place you know. at the wrong time. Right, yeah, exactly, <laughs> or the wrong place at the wrong yeah. time or, or well, something. Because um, yeah. Grant had by horseback <laughs> travel 
too shallow. At least we know one time that's when his horse fell in the mud and he was in. Well, that shallow. No, he he was at Pittsburgh Landing. Uh, that's on the fourth when he gets word that there's been this major skirmish out there and and the problem, of course, that uh, that Grant has keeping his headquarters in Savannah, uh, is that McClernand is the ranking general at uh, at Shiloh, uh when Grant is away. And that's the reason that probably he's kept McClernand at Savannah for so long. He only brings McClernand down <laughs> relatively late in the game because McClernand outranks Sherman. Probably some of the reason that he keeps Wallace here at, at Crump's Landing because Wallace outranks Sherman. And he wants Sherman to be in command of the operation at Pittsburgh Landing itself. And so when he finds out there's this something going on and McClernand is the ranking officer down there, I better get down there. So he heads down there real quick and uh, that's when, you know, it's raining like crazy and all that, and that's when his, um, his uh, um, horse falls on him and so on at Pittsburgh Landing. So I don't, I'm not sure that Grant has ever traveled okay. these roads either. I'm, I'm not convinced so, of that. The only road he knew was this river. This, yeah, this the river, river is the interstate of that yeah. day. That's the only route that probably he knew. Didn't Rollins on Grant's staff help kind of propagate the notion that, that Lou Wallace was notified way before time, something saying to the extent that Lou Wallace knew by 10 or 10.30 that morning. There, uh, there's a whole lot of that. Um, in fact, I am convinced, you know, I'm a, I've told y'all before, I'm a Grant fan. I like Grant. I think he was the best general produced during the, during the war. Uh, but I'm not afraid to call him out on certain things. Uh, number one being uh, his overconfidence early in the war. He's, he just thinks that I'm the only one that's going to start anything and nothing's going to happen unless I start it. We saw that vividly at Fort Donaldson last year. Um, another thing is his cronyism. And I think this follows him, you know, for in politics and everything else. He, he liked his buddies uh, and his buddies always didn't, you know, produce the results that he wanted or he needed. And uh, he, in some cases, was a pretty bad judge of character uh, in in terms of who he who he liked. Uh, but if you were good with Grant, you were you were good. If you were not, then you didn't have a chance. Wallace and McClernand and a lot of these other um, uh, politician generals were were not. And so I'm convinced that that Grant's buddies, uh, Rawlins and Riley and and McPherson and some of these others. Um, basically got their story straight and you see this in April 1863 when they're approaching Vicksburg and uh, the War Department's got involved and Wallace has said I want <clears throat> I want you to investigate and clear my name you know and so they write Grant and say okay well, I need reports from all these guys and so on and if you look in the official records um, all of McPherson and Rollins and all their accounts in volume 10 which is 1862 uh, Shiloh are written in April 1863 in front, and they'll they'll say you know in front of Vicksburg is is where they're writing their story, and and I can't prove it, but I'm just convinced that you know Grant's gotten the message that they're going to do this and all that, and we need your accounts, and we're going you know so on, and I just betting that Grant got all his boys together one night in the cabin on the Magnolia there, his headquarters ship down on the river at Young's Point, and uh, said all right boys McPherson and Raleigh and and Rawlins and all. Let's get our story straight, and and let's let's get this let's get this together. And of course, Wallace is going to be the scapegoat of all this. And it's remarkable how similar all of their accounts from April 1863 are. You know, which uh, is kind of maybe some some, some funny business uh, going on there. The, yeah. about, that's the time Grant over here. Let's sit down and write this story. Keep our story straight. Like a addendum to one of the reports or something, he says says something just incredibly damning about Wallace. He, he said if Morgan Smith had been in command in Wallace's place, that a lot of the people who were killed, just paraphrasing, yeah. at the battle wouldn't have died. Right. That's how I read that, and it just makes my jaw drop. Exactly, yeah. And, <laughs> you can't and, say anything worse about a commanding general. Exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you can't. So it's not, uh, I think the point there is too, definitely animosity yeah, that was there. Yeah, you know, I think the point, too, is if I, everything that I read says is correct, is that is that if Lew Wallace was so incompetent on that day that he got lost, then the next day on the battle, didn't Grant ride out to him and tell him, hey, as, as things progress today, you make your own decisions? Um, 
Something along that Something line? Something along those lines. Yeah. Well, what we'll see <laughs> this afternoon is we hike Wallace's route. Uh, we're, or Wallace's actions on the second day, we're going to see, I think, that Wallace performs pretty doggone well. In fact, is able to do what no other people in the Army is able to do, and that is leverage the Confederate line out of their original position. Um, and he takes a lot of flack for that because he doesn't, he doesn't do a lot of fighting. It's more maneuver uh, and outflanking the Confederate line. Uh, and he doesn't sustain a lot of casualties. He has his guys lay down and, and so on. And everybody says, well, he didn't do much fighting. He was scared uh, because he didn't lose a lot of people, you know. I would have wanted to have been in his division. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy, we, we fought hard and we lost every man, you know. We're, we're good, you know. No, I would have wanted to have been in his division. Um, it's like the, uh, the old Bobby Bear song. Y'all remember the Bobby Bear song that... Uh, um, he talks about the winner. That's what it is, the winner. And he's got a cauliflower ear and a broken nose, and his teeth fell out like chiclets and all that. And he's fighting this guy for this woman in a bar. And he, he said he finally got her and all that. And she gets uglier and meaner every day. But I got her, boy. I'm the winner. I got her. Okay, one more thing. Here comes the Lexington uh, downriver to uh, check on Crump's Landing. There were three naval gunboats involved in the operation here. Two were the timber class Lexington and Tyler. The other is actually the city class ironclad Cairo, which was here as late as I believe April, the, the morning of April the fourth. I believe is when she shoves off and goes back down river and, and eventually to the to the Mississippi, leaving of course the Tyler and the Lexington here. Uh, when the battle breaks out on the morning of April the fifth or April the sixth, um, the Tyler will remain uh, near uh, Pittsburgh Landing watching there. Of course, they go into action later in the day. The Lexington itself will actually move up and down the river. I believe it's the Lexington. I may be getting them mixed up, but I think it's the Lexington actually comes to Crump's Landing to check on things, um, you know, periodically throughout the day and then will return and is in action uh, later during the night, uh, the evening as well. So here comes uh, here comes the Lexington, and we better go before we are bombarded out of our position. I think the river looked at that time to the what river we're seeing now. It was much smaller at the time because of the, the, the dam damming of, well, that's. That's upriver. That doesn't affect down here. What affects here is Kentucky Dam up near the Ohio, uh, way on on up in Kentucky. You know, this in is fact, Kentucky Lake, right? if you look on USGS maps, it's on. This is actually labeled Kentucky Lake. So actually, the landing itself would probably been on farther out and so on. So the river is larger today than it was then. Mm -hmm. They channelized it too. So yeah, they channeled it. Channeled it on this side, or was, do we have it cut at all times? Yeah. Anyway, hey, no. you see the blue, you see the green over yeah, there, and the green orange over here. I'm betting if we uh, stood here long enough and watched this barge come around, he would go right, yeah. right through that's this. That's the yeah. Oh, the birds are the pleasure boats go a different way. Yeah, they can go. And the little boats can go. Oh, How many okay. bends are there before you get to the Pittsburgh land? It's fairly straight from here. Uh, you still have Diamond Island down there, of course, that uh, you can you can go around. But it's it's a fairly straight shot from here to to Pittsburgh Landing. You south. can't see it about from here. six miles or so. No, you can't no. see it. From six here. miles by water. Six miles by water airline. It's basically straight. So, okay, we do have other stops, so we better we better get on. All right. Hey, well, let me tell you where we're going now. Um, we're going to Stony Lonesome uh, on Highway 64, where we take after we get on 64, where we take the left. Uh, that'll be the that'll be the high ground. Watch as we go up, kind of on that high ground, uh, and we take that left. That'll be Stony Lonesome, and we will be on the Shun Pike then. I don't think there's any need to stop right there. Uh, but we'll follow the historic route of the Shun Pike down until we stop, and then that's where I'll tell you um, what's going on there. You never this warned about ghost rides. I was in the Air Force. We don't do that follow me. <laughs> we just with the, the major say good luck. <laughs> I'll make sure I'm behind Tony. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Enough people do get like this whole Sunday head kill. <laughs> oh, yeah. I thought you said you were coming up. I didn't know you were coming up. I didn't know you were coming up. I did I I I'm going to go to the 
Yeah, there were uh, toll roads and so on. Of course, part of what you're bypassing maybe is the river and, and so on. But uh, uh, this is America's love affair with the automobile and all that. But you, you do get the idea. First known use of Shun Pike, 1804. Um, what made you want to look up Shun Pike? Please tell us. Lou was. Anyway, all right. We are standing in the middle of the Shun Pike, of course. Um, and it's great. Don't you love old roads? I mean, this is, this is pretty cool. Now, it may not have been this deep uh, at this point. Mona, um, well, I've learned never ask a lady how old they are, but we're, I'll ask it like what this. What was it like then? Where are you? <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember Lou Holtz? When, when you were here, <laughs> when you were a little girl, was this road still open? I believe it was open up through the 50s. And right. I'm I'm not well, saying you were. I'm not, but I've heard people using this road, you know, in in the 50s and maybe early 60s. Yeah. You know, it was like a like a cut through road. It wasn't right. Good road. Still, Highway 117 goes in. I believe mm -hmm. this was one this of the main. This is still an active road. Main, an active road. Mm -hmm. So you know, it could have been dug out a little more then and so on. But um, it was dry weather. They couldn't use it. You know, in. Yeah, I'll, it was never hard surface or anything. So uh, I don't think it ever had gravel on either. Yeah, so I mean, you can. Mm. It, it wouldn't have been much different than than yeah. this. So, uh, but it was still usable down to the old overshot uh, mill site there. So, uh, Wallace, where the road turned, where we parked, where it made that big curve, the road would just continue right on, right on that. Okay. That's good. That's good. That's good. One of the things in determining where things are, uh, obviously you can plot it on a map, and I did that, and I overlaid the modern map with the historic map and, and so on, and you know, you can see where the, the crossover road left uh, the, the modern road, or the, the shun pike, um, but getting that down to the exact spot in the middle of the woods is a little bit difficult. <laughs> but I can safely say that we are within the pretty close area of where the crossover road left off. Now there were two crossover roads actually. One is a little farther down, closer to Overshot Mill, uh, that kind of hugged the, the lip of the, the ravine off, of, off into Snake Creek. Uh, the other is a little farther up that was apparently a more used road that Wallace chose to use. It's right in this area that Dick Pickens, he meets uh, this guy named Dick Pickens, uh, who tells him, yeah, this crossover, this will reach the river road and, and so on over there. Uh, so he comes up to, to right about here, and I've explored out in here. I mean, you, you look at places like this, I mean, you can kind of see, um, it looks like maybe a little road right, you know, right where you're standing right here. Um, but then that, I mean, there's been 150 years of stuff going on since then. And that could have been a driveway, you know, or it could have been, I, you just don't know. But I am confident that we are in the the general area of where the crossover road left. Now, when Wallace came back, they came to this specific point, and they placed a marker that said, by this route, General mm -hmm. Wallace's, actually they said Army, which we know was not an Army, it was a division. They should have said division, I guess. But uh, anyway, he's a politician, what does he know? Um, they, <laughs> the uh, the stake said something like that. Uh, the stake said um, said by this route, General Wallace crossed over on the crossover road to Wallace's or to to the river road and so on. And um, you know that's gone too. Wish I wish like everything they would have marked some of this and permanently. You know. uh, yeah, that's that's part of it right there. But um, you know, we just we just don't know. Yeah, the. Um, uh, the ridge that goes down into this valley, I have traced it down there, and you can see some faint um, areas that I think are part of the old crossover road. Now, elsewhere on the crossover road, you could, it'll it'll rejoin Modern Road, and this later on when we come back, 
and follow his after his counter march i'll take y'all on portions of the crossover road which are portions of modern day roads as well um but anyway it's, it's right in this this general area that we uh horses split from over. shun pike to river road how far yeah uh we're talking uh i would say a couple of miles maybe three miles or so not not a long distance what was the question at all the split, the difference How far you know, between the distance between the, between the two. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <clears throat> all right. Uh, we'll continue on now. We're going to walk all the way down to Overshot Mill. Uh, We're not going to stop here for long, but um, if you look to your right as we make, this road will kind of curve around to the west a little bit, exactly the way it did then. Uh, but the actual road, if you look just to your right, you'll see the trace of the old road down in there. So if any of you are just absolutely channeling your inner Wallace and you want to go on the actual route, you can do that. I'm going to walk on the nicer road here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you can see the, the actual route there. I know, I'll be right off the road to do it. Yeah, I'll be near to the end. Oh, okay. Yeah. This is kind of hard. Tannehill. Yeah, we got a little rugged there. Tannehill.